Good afternoon and welcome to Harlem Sculpture Gardens. This is your host, Savannah Bailey McLean, Executive Director of the West Harlem Art Fund. And today in the studio, we have Michael Gromley, who is the Executive Director of New York Artists Equity Association. Welcome, Michael. How are you? I'm good, Savona. Thank you so much for asking me to come and talk to you today. Thank you so much for coming. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about your organization. Uh, New York Artists Equity Association has been around since 1947. 1947. That is a long time. And I did some research just to find out what was going on in the country at that time. So I learned that the Truman Doctrine, or the Cold War, began. Also, the CIA began in the year of 1947. Jackie Robinson started playing for the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now, that holds a little bit of memory for me because my grandmother used to say that she preferred the Brooklyn Dodgers over the New York Yankees for that reason. American painters explored Cubism as well as surrealism. And then your organization began with 160 members. So why don't you tell us what was the mission behind your organization? Well, in 1947, Savona, you have going on a, a, a few different things. Mm -hmm. One is there's uh, the WPA mm -hmm. has ceased existing a couple of years before, and that had provided American artists in specific with uh, income right. exhibition opportunities. And suddenly that goes away almost overnight. So, so you have American artists without any um, exhibition opportunities or means to support themselves and their families. Simultaneously, um, there's an influx of European artists coming mm -hmm. into America, and they're still considered the hot ticket. That's what right. you should exhibit. That's what you should buy. You should you know, not really buy American art. And so these artists, in particular Jacob Lawrence, uh, his wife Gwendolyn Knight, Paul Cadmus, mm -hmm. uh, Yashu Kuniyoshi, they get together and they decide we need to band together mm. to take care of each other. So they're establishing community. Now, when you think about that group in 1947, the, 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 one, there's a Japanese mm -hmm. gentleman. There's mm -hmm. uh, two people of color. Mm -hmm. There's a man that identifies as LGBTQ+. Wow. This is in 1947. So, you know, we're doing diversity well before it's even fashionable. Yes. And, we're, and it's just a little dangerous, actually, sort of, uh, especially you know, the incoming, the first president is mm -hmm. Yashu Kuriyoshi, he's a Japanese man. I'm going to ask uh, our engineer if he could show us that image of your first president. I think he was a very interesting individual. Amazing painter. So, so they come together and they decide, we're going to support each other. We are going to build our own market. We're going to host our own exhibitions. We're going to let the public know that we're here. Mm -hmm. And we're going to also do it in a way that's totally equitable. Mm -hmm. So uh, they're focusing on half their, their membership are women. Mm -hmm. There are people of color. So there's no block to getting access to the art world, which, again, in 1947 is... Um, you know, three generations of head where we are now. Yes. Right. Exactly. In fact, I think we have another image showing like an event that took place. Uh, I think it was like a dinner party sort of situation, but it does show the diversity of the membership and who all you were trying to protect at that particular time. So I didn't know that backdrop story of your organization. Um, I was very aware of the WPA program. Um, Charles Austin led the team that did the murals at Harlem Hospital. He used to have conversation with Diego Rivera in French. I always thought that was very <laughs> impressive. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, I am aware how these artists were trying to help each other. Um, Orozco, who was helping uh, Jackson Pollock learn how to do the drip. It wasn't his original idea. So there was a lot of this give and take that was going back. I, I think this is great. I think when, when they're up against this uh, diversity, mm -hmm. and uh, sorry, adversity, Okay. and they, and they have no market and, and no means to support themselves. There's not much of a choice in, in what okay. we can do that we really need to sort of support each other. And they go so far as to set up a fund 
to um, help artists that are in emergency need. Mm -hmm. so, th so they set that up. And then they start lobbying Congress to give them tax breaks oh. so that they can afford housing for their more senior members. Mm -hmm. So that early on, they're doing lots of lobbying with the government to try to protect themselves. So soon after that, they begin showing on 10th Street, which in the village is then this fledgling gallery row mm -hmm. of showing mostly post-war American artists. Mm -hmm. and, and this sort of gets some attention. They, you know, they begin to uh, get some, some notice in the public and, mm -hmm. and they start to build a market for American artists. Uh, soon after that, they move to Soho, oh, when wow. that is sort of a, a, a fledgling art district, and they set up Equity Gallery, which is on Broom Street. Okay. So directly west where we are currently, right? Mm -hmm. So they must love Broom Street. And they're there for 25 years exhibiting artists. And, and you know, when there's maybe three or four other spaces happening in Soho. So, so they're constant, consistently on the forefront mm -hmm. of establishing American arts as a, a viable, diverse mm -hmm. practice. Wow. I, I just think this is fascinating. So my question to you is, how do you feel uh, about having Jacob Lawrence and Gwendolyn Knight as members and this Harlem connection that you have? Well, it's, uh, it's excellent that... You know, I, I think the art world now is trying very hard to be diverse in a very honest and genuine way. Mm -hmm. I often think sometimes it sort of becomes sort of cherry picking and sort of only sort of looking for those that are famous or might be famous. And um, But the earlier shot that was up on the screen was mm -hmm. uh, the 50th anniversary wow. of uh, Equity. Uh, and they honored Jacob Lawrence and his wife, Gonzalo Knight. And that became a very big fundraiser for the organization. Um, in 2015, the Gwendolyn Knight and Jacob Lawrence Foundation gave New York Artists Equity Association enough money to open our Lower East Side space. Okay. Because the Lower East Side at that juncture had become uh, the, emergement, uh, sorry, the emerging art district, mm -hmm. right? so where new galleries and young emerging artists. So this is before Chelsea. Uh, so this is this is after Soho and currently where we are now. Okay. Right. So so not only was his legacy uh, established early on by being an early board member, which is again mm -hmm. in 1947 is mm -hmm. uh, extremely it's radical. Mm -hmm. It's radical. Uh, they then are the funding source uh, to to get us back up and having a gallery running because mm -hmm. there was a period of time when. Uh, we didn't have a gallery, mm -hmm. and we, the association was acting more as a re-grant organization, okay. where they were sort of giving artists funds to either support their studio practice or have exhibitions, but we're sort of we're, we're without a gallery, and the association board decides that really what we need to do is get back into the business of exhibiting our artists. Okay. Um, so so what, what this means is... We're, we're wedded to this idea about diversity, mm -hmm. and our founder, the one that's footing the bill, <laughs> is, a, is a black couple, right, from Harlem. Yes. Right? So um, it becomes so, – so fast forward 2015, and they're thinking, what should we call the place? What, we don't have a name yet for this gallery, this new gallery, right? That's uh, – Right? So it's not Equity Gallery. It's, this is the first time we, we christened it Equity mm -hmm. Gallery, and – Oh, and everybody's saying that's that's such an old-fashioned word, and nobody's going to know what that means. And I thought about it, and I thought maybe they'll catch up with us. Maybe, maybe the world will. So, and sure enough, by 2018, every gallery in New York is working hard to be diverse and equitable, and write that into their mission statements. And you know, we're sort of gloating, saying, "Well, you know, we've been doing it since 1947." Okay, so that makes a lot of sense because. Uh, I didn't know how you came up with Equity Gallery. And so it does make a lot of sense about how you bring about diversity, how do you make it more inclusive. And so this is great. And I'm so glad now that I know this full history. I thought I did, but I didn't. But now I feel very glad that your organization is partnering with my organization, the West Harlem Art Fund, to bring about Harlem Sculpture Gardens, which would be this large-scale outdoor
outdoor sculpture exhibition in Morningside, St. Nicholas, and Jackie Robinson Park, all three historic parks. Only Morningside has the scenic landmark designation, but these linear parks, which um, are noted for the uh, geography of the area, the Manhattan Schist, the cliffs that are there, going back to the American Revolution, all of that history is incorporated in these locations. So now you're a part of this. Do you feel like things are coming into like a bit of a full circle? Oh, absolutely. I, 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 I was so excited about the project when you first approached me about it. I, um, <clears throat> I think to begin, not only did the early founders of New York Art Association and subsequently Equity Gallery think that we should be helping emerging artists mostly from underserved communities, right? That's mm -hmm. a big part of it mm -hmm. as well. Um, that we should be doing similarly for viewers, for, for people to, to have art accessible to everyone. That mm -hmm. this, is, this is every person's legacy. Yes. This isn't just uh, culture that's available to uh, those that can afford it right. or those that have the correct education or mm -hmm. the correct connections or, mm -hmm. or, or, or know to... Go into a gallery. I mean, it's always self-selecting anyway. So, so mm -hmm. the so the idea for me when you approached us about partnering on Harlem Sculpture Gardens is, of course, we need to be having art out for for people to get access to. Right. And um, and for that to be across the board in all places of the city, not mm -hmm. just limited to whatever is the trending art district of the moment that, mm -hmm. we, that we need to, you know, just a, a real brief aside, uh, we had done a pop-up on 14th Street in Union Square a okay. couple of years ago for that very reason, okay. that we need to have art in public accessible spaces and, and that is um, friendly and yes. inviting and accessible and sort of opens the door to the the, the, the greater good and the beauty that art can bring to a community. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons, I should say, one of the reasons why I started my organization was for that reason. From a child, I was always interested in art, not so much as an artist, but to view it. And so being the oldest and <coughs> the shortest <laughs> of my sisters, I would drag them to museums. You would think it would be the parent that would do that. My family on both sides, mother and father, are from the South. Both came up during the black migration to New York. My grandmother first, bringing relatives up one at a time. I used to call her our black Moses, bringing people up. And education was very important. And so therefore, my wanting to go to museums was okay with my mother, who had never in her entire life, been to a museum, even after I started going. So she thought it was a great opportunity. So I would drag my sisters. We would go to MoMA. We would go to the Met, and we would look at the various art. When I came out of college, I found that people were equally intimidated by the arts. I couldn't believe it. You're afraid to go into a gallery? People were intimidated about looking stupid, not knowing what the right way should be in looking at art, not understanding how they should describe it. I said, however you wish. And so without going to college for art, not knowing that was an opportunity, I said, oh, maybe if I help to bring art and open public spaces, this would help people see the beauty of art in their own neighborhoods. I had no idea how political that was, mm. that you know, trying to present public art in New York City was really in the domain of the wealthy. It wasn't in the domain for ordinary people. So did you find that to be some of your experience, how public art really wasn't as accessible as it appeared to be? Oh, absolutely. And so I had approached the New York State Council of the Arts on okay. this idea that, um, that in addition to and they're a great funding source for us. They're, they're very generous. And, and they, I think they really believe in the diversity and inclusion of our mission. Mm -hmm. And similarly, explain to them that, I, you know, I, can, I can't get, I can't drag people into the gallery. Right. Because of the, there's an entrenched institutional um, 
blockage to that. We're talking about generations of who goes to galleries and who doesn't go to galleries and who goes to museums and who doesn't go to museums and who's had the education, who hasn't had the education. So you've got to disrupt it, Savona, in some right. way. Like where can you disrupt that institutionalized racism? It's essentially it's racist. Is to my thinking, your thinking, is public art. Right. I mean, and it's got to be public art that's funded. It's got to be public, because we're, now we're going back to what artist has the resources to make the art and Correct. have had the education to make the art. Do they have the studio space to make the art? And that also becomes institutionalized racism. Yes. So, so we're, we're at a point where we're saying no more. Okay. Right? So we're going to make sure that there's public art and that public art is not only friendly, accessible, and beautiful and important, we're going to find the money for it. Okay. So I, remember when we did that project with Miguel? Yes. I Why don't you talk about that? I think we have an image that? of uh, Miguel's work, Miguel Otero Fuentes. And I love that piece. It's a, it's a beautiful piece. It's a big piece, too. It weighs about, what, 600 pounds? <laughs> I think there were seven guys that were involved in raising that piece. But, yes. So... So, so the United States, uh, New, sorry, New York State mm -hmm. Council on the Arts, God bless them, um, made a public uh, sculpture fund available oh, okay. based on uh, not only my quarters, but I'm sure from other quarters as well, thinking this is a really good idea. And Miguel came up with this concept, and it's called XOXO, Hug Kiss, Hug Kiss. And it was meant to be a piece that... Um, Anybody could interact with. Right. That there was no, you didn't need to have any kind of special education or you need to talk about it in any kind of way that was obtuse or important that you could just love it. Yeah. And it was also meant to uh, be the perfect spot for selfies. Mm -hmm. That you would go into here and sort of be embraced by this, this hug and this kiss and, and with your family and with your loved ones. And um, so we didn't have a place to put it, which was kind of a lie. Mm -hmm. So um, so that's when we called you. And I remembered that you had a house mm -hmm. out on Governor's Island mm -hmm. uh, where you were doing art projects. Um, and I approached Miguel and said, we should, we should call Savona and say we would love to land, um, site this mm -hmm. sculpture there. And, um, and then we were able to get the money to fabricate it. And, and Miguel, you know, Got his whole family up from Puerto Rico. Yes, he did. I met his father. <laughs> he had his brother there. I was like, wow, this is a real family <laughs> Well, we're sort of situation. all hands on deck, too. Because, yeah. again, this idea about, you know, having some funding but needing a lot of help and assistance. And that made it, you know, genuine and heartwarming for all of us it to did. watch Miguel work so hard, uh, who is also is, is, uh, from Puerto Rico. To uh, to realize this sculpture, and and then we did a dance performance for it, right? Uh, that we had NYU involved with producing, so it's gotten a lot of attention, and I think has opened a door for us mm -hmm. in in making a good case mm -hmm. for our premise that yes. that uh, art uh, be best served for the people uh, in their neighborhoods, yes, um, with funding from uh, both private and public sources. Yes, I, I, and I agree with that. I mean, I don't mind, because I have presented public art throughout New York City, four out of the five boroughs in a variety of neighborhoods, as well as noted areas like Times Square. That was the largest installation I presented in Times Square, uh, Counting Sheep. Uh, but it's great when you can bring it to neighborhoods where people can identify. And since the mandate for uh, public art, particularly with the Parks Department, is site-specific work, then you can incorporate the history, the landscape, the cultural um, attributes of a community in that public work. So therefore, everyone feels that they can at least you know, identify with it. They don't have to like it. But they can at least identify, and since it's for a short period of time, less than a year, you don't have to live with it for a very long period of time. But it gives, you know, that beginning uh, where you can have more, you can feel good about yourself. So, yes, I, I think this is great. So I'm very excited about the possibility of doing this project, Harlem Sculpture Gardens, next year, uh, across a very large landscape 
and we're trying to bring in some new technology, uh, geofencing, where we can add layers of sound art, dance, which could be, you know, um, short performances. I think this would resonate with a lot of New Yorkers. How do you feel? Well, when I think about why why there's a, a, a lack of neighborhood attendance at a museum or why there's lack of attendance at a gallery. Well, my feeling is it's divorced from anything that's genuine mm. for the people in that community. Like, what does it have to do with them? It's, it's always brought in by some third party that has nothing to do with the community. So I, I think this idea about public art being basically thought about mm -hmm. and wedded to that site for that community is also a radical idea. So, so we're not coming at it from this, you know, outside aesthetic engagement. We're, we're coming at it from, um, uh, you know, an everyman point of view, uh, a point of view that's um, egalitarian. I like that. Right? It's like the boardwalk of art. Yes, right? I, I get that. I, I really do appreciate your words because so many people feel you know, so intimidated or feel now that real estate has gotten so expensive in New York City that when you do anything that is beautiful, it is to push them out to make way for somebody else. So when you say radical, yes, because if you can bring the arts in communities, well, maybe you can stem some of these real estate costs. So therefore, it doesn't continually skyrocket and you price people out because now they're invested. Now they feel a part of it. Now they can benefit it. And um, I think that's that's a good thing. That reminds me of the old New York that I grew up in, where you had neighborhoods of people from various backgrounds coming together, sharing, living in the same space. Well, I just want to say thank you, Michael, for coming so we can kick this all off, this whole uh, video podcast series, and share this with folks around the city and hope that they will, you know, support us next year. Absolutely, and I thank you so much as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and we look forward to our next episode of Harlem Sculpture Garden with more people. And we really want to delve into the artists, the politics, uh, the landscape that's involved in trying to make public art more accessible. Thank you so very, very much.